would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to these meetings. It turns out this is the fourth time when I am attending these meetings about non-parametric statistics, which later became non-parametric statistics and change point analysis there. I thought that I was in Rennes at this institute twice. It turned out I was here three times. So this is my fourth time here. Okay, so somebody already pointed out that looking at the abstract, that I have a paper alone, okay? And he hasn't seen me with a paper when there are no co-authors, okay? It turned out this is a mistake. I have three co-authors uh, two, uh, uh, two co on this paper. Okay, so the setup is uh, very interesting, at least it was interesting for me. Peter Jacobs, uh, he's a computer scientist. Cooper, he's a data scientist. And uh, he was working, okay, as a translator between the two of us. Like, talking about completely, completely different things there. The project was interesting, so essentially computer science started to work on. On one of the proceedings, they found a paper, but they thought it was interesting. And also, they liked the applications there. So if I forget, I don't have my watch, okay? So Ingrid must stop me, okay? When time is up there. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, so before we came here, we had two sets of visitors, so they left Sunday evening. Monday I was teaching until 8 p.m. So the outcome is that we left all, uh, left all kinds of things at home, so yesterday we had to go shopping. Yeah, so, sorry about that one, I tried to borrow my wife's but she wouldn't give it to me. Okay, so, what the problem is? So, people, they found a paper which was published in computer science, and then they wanted to reproduce the data there. They said, they told me, that they are not able to do it. And I was asked to help on that one. So, like what they were doing and how they created, okay, those tables, what they obtained. Only thing what was said, that using the algorithm, and they were two names. One of them was Ivers, two papers started, then the other one was B. So, you know, I, I know here I doubt, okay, that he published algorithm in Journal of Multivariate Analysis. So, based on that one, essentially it was impossible to recreate the study what they did there. But, the data, what those guys were using, it was very interesting. So, they looked at the darknet. This was the first time that I heard about it. Okay, and uh, based on the chatter on the darknet, they tried to essentially to see if change in the chatter, whatever people were doing there, it was like some kind of a sign for a terrorist activity there. So they used the data, they really connected. Okay, this point is there. And they said, okay, that this is working very nicely. I had deep doubts about that one, okay, when you do not know how good was essentially achieved that. You cannot essentially create it. And of course, they never give us the data there. So people in computer science wanted to know what we can, what we can do about that one if there is like, okay, some kind of uh, way to do it. The other thing was what bothered them. So, in the paper, what they looked at, the sample size was 500. So essentially, they had the data set, and looking at it, they tried to connect those events there. But the dimension of the data was 50. So the question was, if 500 is like something, okay, which is going to infinity, how come that 50 is considered, okay, is a small number? Yeah, it's a natural question there. So, we went back, okay, and we started to work on this one here, like to do some kind of a theory about it. The setup, okay, this is essentially the standard one. We have a sequence of random vectors in the d-dimensional space there, and we would like to die the, test the null hypothesis that these distributions are the same, against the alternative that we have R changes in the distribution. This is a typical setup there, okay, so when you talk about use statistics and so on, typically, okay, you end up testing if one of the parameters remains stable there instead of talking about the whole distribution there. So, what it is essentially, and following the paper, what they look at it, 
we were looking at U statistics, okay, using LP norms there, P, okay, is larger than equal to 1 there. Okay, so, the first one is the U statistic, okay, using K observations there, and we are comparing the distance between the elements of the set there. The second one, okay, you are doing the same thing, but we are using the last N minus K observations. This is a very nice, okay, and a simple thing. This is a typical thing how change point analysis is done. You cut the data into two parts then, okay, at the point K. You compute the parameter in the first part. You compute the parameter from the second part. And you decide if there is at least one K, then this difference is large. There is an other version of that one, okay, and it says the following, that when you cut the data into two parts at time k there, you are using k observations from the first part, you are using n minus k observations from the other part, you compute the distances between them, and this is compared, okay, when these distances are com uh, computed from the whole sample there. Okay, we are looking at maximum type statistics there, so we have in a form like that one which is written down there. Okay, so instead of k, we are using n times t there. Okay, t is running between 2 divided by n and 1 minus 2 divided by n. So in this case, all those two statistics are well defined what we have here. D is this normalization there, okay, the t times 1 minus t. This is some sense, okay, technicality there, as we see later in the proof. Whenever we work with new statistics, at least in the simplest case, we would like to replace uh, with them with the projections, those are partial sums, and in this case, okay, this is needed something like that, okay, to have it. Okay, now, in this case, usually the dimension is going into the variance of these processes there. In this case, we will assume that D is also going to be infinity together with N there, so this is the reason, okay, so we have this normalization also with D, the dimension to the power 1 half minus 1 divided by P there. So these are, okay, two processes there, and we are looking at the weighted functionals of this one here, how they are behaving under the new hypothesis there. Okay, so what should I push? Um, which one? To the right. The right, okay. Okay, so to have the process is okay on zero one, the essential okay this is zero, this is again a technical condition there. So we have a series of assumptions what we would like to do. Now let's okay, we are using weighted statistics and this requires a weight function there. We are following okay the classical literature there, the limits are always related to Brownian motions, okay, Brownian bridges there, on the tail those are exactly the same thing there. So, the weight functions what we do, again, it can be only zero at the end there. So this means that essentially we are trying to detect changes as early as possible there, so therefore we are putting more weights to the observations at the beginning at the end, hoping, okay, that even if we have full observations, we can still detect the change point there. Okay, the, the next one here is, okay, that this is non-decreasing in the neighborhood of zero, and the same thing essential error one there, again, these are just technical conditions there, in the story of like these upper lower classes that it turns out, okay, that is the interesting conditions there. Whether the limit will be finite, this is essentially given by these integral conditions there, so as long as this integral condition is finite, for at least one C there, then in this case, okay, we will see that the limiting process exists. So essentially, okay, the conditions, what we have there, at least concerning the weight function, those are necessary sufficient conditions there. Okay, so this is a classical, I wrote the names there, okay, how we started. Ito McKean, Chibi Shogorelli, those were the ones who looked at the weighted empirical processes, which is seen, okay, this is again Brownian image, and they talk about, okay, how to use these functionals 
to find necessary and sufficient conditions. Now, there are again a few technical conditions there under the null hypothesis. Uh, there is no change point there, so essentially we are looking at independent random variables there. Okay, as you can see, those are also assumed that those are independent of each other. There are a few conditions, okay, about this one. The first one is the moment conditions there. Okay, so these are identically distributed. You are looking at the coordinates there, and then you are looking at, okay, the alpha moment there. Okay, this should be uniformly bounded, so this means that when this is getting larger, then in this case the C will be, okay, exactly the same there. Then, okay, the next slide here, I thought that I changed this one, okay, those, those labels there, so I don't know what happened. Okay, so when we are looking at, okay, the next one here, okay, essentially what we are looking at is the so-called projection there. So when you would like to prove any kind of results, of course, on new statistics there, this is the first thing, okay, which is done, you will essentially define the corresponding projection there. Now, here comes the condition. So due to the applications, so what we had in mind and what those people had in mind was that you are looking at words, okay, on the internet there. So this means essentially the observation of what you have is a multinomial data, okay, then essentially the number of the lots is relatively large there. You do not want to assume, okay, those are independent of each other. So as the application you will see that essentially the words, those are relatively similar to each other there. So what we assume is essentially, okay, that there are some kind of a weak dependence between the coordinates. Okay, I will return this one here, what happens if the dependence between the coordinates, okay, those are relatively, relatively strong there. If you look at it, okay, conditions of 2 and 3 there, okay, these are, they look like moment conditions. The weak dependence, okay, comes in the pictures there, when we are looking at, okay, like the alpha moment there, this is bounded by d to the power alpha half. So in some sense it's telling you, okay, that the idea is when you are looking at those coordinates there, those coordinates, when d goes to infinity, will satisfy the central limit theorem there. So this is the v condition in the sense, okay, that, that for the coordinates, okay, that the central limit theorem will be satisfied there. Okay. Now, there is, of course, the asymptotic variance there, this is coming out again from the projections that v goes to infinity there. If you look at it, okay, when you are looking at this one, of course you are looking at the sum of the projection of the coordinates there due to the big dependence, this is increasing like d there. So there is a limit, okay, when d is going to infinity there. The others, okay, what we have here, that we need to define the corresponding expected value of the projections, okay, and essentially we need to have the variance, okay, of the corresponding, okay, Gaussian random variables there. So, the condition here, the sigma square is positive, this means that we are looking at non-generate uh, statistics there, okay, so essentially the limit distribution determined by the projections, the projections are partial sum. I will return later on, okay, like what we can do when there is an, okay, like degenerate two statistics which are used very often in computer science. So the theorem provides the necessary and sufficient condition under the null hypothesis when the observations are independent and identically distributed there, then in this case the weighted supremum is going in distribution to the Brownian bridge divided by, okay, the weight function there. According to those results that I mentioned before, okay, this is a necessary and sufficient condition because the limit is only finite if this integral function is finite for at least one C there. We have the same thing, okay, for the other statistics there. In the first case, you are looking at, okay, the standard Brownian bridge. In the other case, okay, what you have is a little bit much more complicated at least this is not the Brownian bridge, which is very nicely tolerated there. We are looking at a different type of process there. 
if you look at it, okay, it may be not so easy to see, but you can convince yourself that when t goes to 0 or uh, t goes to 1, again, this process, what we have, it will go down to 0 there, so essentially the tail behavior of gamma t is like the tail of the Brownian bridge at 0 and 1 there. The next result is much more interesting there. If you look at what the integral functional was, the weight function square root of t times 1 minus t is not allowed. Yeah? So it is clear, hopefully I can go back. Yeah? So think it over. Okay, if you have this one here, then in this case this integral functional, okay, this one here is uh, not fine. But using the square, uh, this square root of t times 1 minus t, this is something okay, which is very important, mainly because this is related to the asymptotic variance there. If you ever try to use like some kind of a maximum likelihood type of argument there, then in this case you are looking at the weight statistics, weighted functionals there, but the theory what we have in case of theorem 1, it cannot be applied. So, other thing, okay, when you have this limit results there. So, what is going to infinity there? N and D, both of them are going to infinity there. But there is no connection between them. Yeah? So essentially, okay, N and D, if the minimum is going to infinity there, then in this case, okay, these conditions are satisfied. In a few cases, okay, what we found in the literature, like there was some kind of a bound, okay, on the sample size, okay, or the dimension as a function of the sample size, nothing like this one is required. So, the next thing what we would like to look at, this uh, famous functional, when we are proportional to the standard deviation there, okay, sometimes it is called self-normalized statistics there, and clearly, whatever we have in the limit there, it will not be something like this one here, because if you would replace WT, okay, in the limit, the square root of t times 1 minus t there, those limits there, okay, would be still correct, but they would be infinity with probability 1 there. Problem like this one here, okay, it turns out that this is oh, a very old one, yeah? So, looking at the statistics like this one here, it was discovered by people working in econometrics in the 1960s there, yeah? So these are all kind of nice and interesting okay, papers written about this one here. All kind of results were proven mainly using simulations there. Okay. So there was the issue there that this was recognized that if you are looking at the limit there, it cannot be infinity there. If you take it on a smaller interval, of course, okay, it will be very, very nicely finite there. So they're looking at functional, so they can the super uh, taken from epsilon, 1 minus epsilon, epsilon is a positive number there. There is a very famous paper by Andrews in Econometrics, which is the leading journal in econometric theory there, when he wrote it there that clearly, in this case, you cannot have a limit distribution there. So the important thing is how to find a good epsilon when, okay, you are using this to get the statistics there. It turned out that the answer that gave you the limit distribution, it was done already by 1956. Okay? So the results what we are using was done, done in the end of 1956, and essentially, okay, the method what they have, some kind of a version of this one is used here. Okay? So what is the meaning of that one, okay, how to do it? So first of all, if you look at this one here, instead of the continuous time, I wrote there the discrete time there. Usually it is better when you are doing calculations in case like that one. So the weight function, what you are looking at is essential, okay? The square root of k times 1 minus k there. It looks like that we are multiplying with it, but in the definition, okay, when you write it down, what are those differences there? That in this case there is a division, okay, with k times 1 minus k there. According to results there, so essentially we can take now the supremum nearly on the whole interval there, of course from not 1 to n minus 1, because we need at least two observations to define the u statistics there. 
The limit distribution, when you look at it, it is an extreme value, and when we are looking at the normalization, okay, this one here is, is a, a little bit completely different, you are using this log function and so on. There. These are theoretical results, okay? The main reason is that the rate of convergence in this darling r plus square theorem is usually relatively slow. The reason for this one is the following. When you do proofs, there are two approximations. Of course, okay, we, when we have partial sum, weakly dependent or, or independent there, sooner or later we will use some kind of a cell approximation there. This is the first step, so essentially whatever we have empirical things there, we will replace with Gaussian processes that this is the first approximation. The next one, we are looking at the supremum of this Gaussian process, and then you are using an extreme value theory for this one. So essentially, okay, this is the next step in the, in the proof there. So this is the reason probably why the rate of convergence is slow. There is a log transformation in the middle of the proof. So essentially, okay, now instead of like some kind of a linear time, everything is going okay, according to log linear time there, so the rate of convergence is not the best. The reason, one of the reason is, if you look at okay, those functions there, they are log functions and things like that one. They look very, very nice, okay, very nice close formula there. But, they are the solutions, an asymptotic solution of an equation there. Yeah? So essentially, what would be the exact solution for this one is not there, and those are written down in a form like this one here because those are appealing. So if you think it over, okay, this A log N, B log N, whatever is inside, it has no, in some sense, statistical meaning than when you divide the square root of N. It could be, oh, okay, so other things there. So, okay, what I would like to show now, okay, is essentially the application part there. So we showed three examples, okay, about this one, and uh, uh, so the examples when the condition is satisfied, when we have multinomial data there, when we have Gaussian observation there and the independent data. The one data what we looked at, okay, is essentially the how many times the US governors are mentioned on Twitter there. Yeah? There are 50 of them, so D is relatively large. So we are trying to check the null hypothesis A that there was like some kind of a change in there. So this is essentially what we obtain. Okay. If you look at this one here, okay, it tells you how the algorithm is working out there. So essentially when you have the first circle there, this was the first change point what we found. And after that, so okay, we were doing this binary segmentation there. And this is essentially what we obtain. Choosing different type of gauge functions there, essentially the number of the change point wasn't exactly the same there. This is typical. So in this case, okay, so based on how they connected, okay, those, those uh, events there, essentially the points were five, which is relatively close to the square root, okay, this was the best one. The next data set was about social justice. Again, they are all kind of, okay, so what they found there, okay, those are related whenever, okay, people gave all kind of speeches that related COVID and things like that one. It turned out only three governors are important in the U.S., the guy in Florida, one, in California, and surprisingly, the governor of Hawaii. He couldn't travel, everybody wanted to go to Hawaii, so it was important what this guy said. The next one here is the words, so it turns out, okay, like, when something okay that happened then okay like the murder of George Floyd and so on, they showed up okay in the in the Twitter okay checking that so essentially there were all kind of changes there and again this is the segmentation of data what we have there. The proof is standard in some sense we use projections we will have partial sums to have weighted limit theorem that you need a strong approximation. Here the distribution of points in some sense depends on N and B there. You cannot use, okay, those uh, country type of units there. They use the score of them bending, okay, which is 
working for Alice and the defense on either is easy. Okay, so what we really would like to do it, and this is essentially why my airfield is paid by the Hinkley Institute for Politics. I would like to point out not only my airfield, even my wife's airfield is paid by them. Okay, how to do this one is professionally. Yeah? So getting the Twitter data there, we would like to see if the sentiment okay, on the internet is changing there. Everything is done, okay, and computer science is very important there because they are running the data collection and also the analysis okay, using, uh, using parallel computing there. Yeah? So like whatever was happening nowadays in the US, they showed up relatively, relatively fast there. So it looks like okay, the Americans are following it. Okay, so data about the use those were related to this uh, abortion. Okay, when people are running for office and uh, in Alaska and things like that one. So like the sentiment, okay, that one uh, will lose very badly in Alaska there. So essentially it came on sequentially. So it was detected like how people were in Alaska were talking about work like a week before the election. There. Yeah. So this is essentially the suspension of how to do it. I don't want to go back, okay, whether okay, this would work on the dark net. Trying to detect like terrorist activities there, getting data from the dark net is a very difficult. Okay, those guys who got the permission from the chief counselor of the university. So I said I would like to stay away from this one, I don't want another visit from the FBI. <laughs> my son is a nuclear scientist and when he got his job, okay, I mean my wife we were also investigated and this was the steer in the neighborhood. Okay, so sorry, okay, I went slowly at the beginning there. If you are interested, okay, I can give you the paper. This was posted on some kind of a social science type of X server. So in the during the last three weeks. This was essentially one of the most often downloaded papers there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Not like the method, okay, the data set. Okay, this is essentially people are interested in it. Thank you.
seems to be a, a self-stellar process. Uh, this is a, a part of a fractional Brennan motion, but there is a change in the Earth parameter. The Earth parameter is the way uh, this trajectory is smooth or smooth. Uh, the larger the, 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 the value of h, the Earth parameter, uh, the smoother is the, the, the trajectory. So here we can try to find where there could be uh, there could be a change. And here there is one change where in the first uh, stage of uh, this trajectory the parameter is 0 0.8 and then at time uh, 650 it uh, goes to uh, 0 0.6. Okay, so the, the aim of this uh, talk is to find where there could be, uh, uh, where the change could be. But this is not really uh, a, a big change. The, the most important thing now is to find how many changes there could be. Uh, here, this is a trajectory where you uh, you have some uh, stationary increments, okay? So if I consider uh, the increments of such trajectory, I have something like this. So here, uh, the first uh, stage is uh, the, the first stage is a long memory process with uh, parameter 0.8 and uh, the other stage with the over uh, with 0.6. So now, a little game. Uh, how, many, how many changes you, you, you may there could be here? Have you any idea of this? Somebody? How many changes? Two? Three. Three. So, uh, it's not really easy to find how many, and uh, so we're going for uh, 0.6, 0.8, 0.95, and 0 0.7. Okay, so it's the same if you consider the increments. And perhaps, I, I do not know if it is easier on it or on it. Uh, Why well, you, you could see that there are some long memory here and the, 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 the larger the, the long memory uh, parameter, uh, you could see some trends uh, in the second part because the parameter is larger. Some trends where you, you're going down and then you're going up, and so. But when uh, the parameter is 0.6, there's not something like this. Okay, so. Uh, Another question could be, if you consider some very famous and historic data as this one, this is the, 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 the lowest annual level of the Nile River, uh, how many changes there could be? So, I have to, to, uh, I'm going to, to show you a procedure for estimating the number of changes and uh, the different places of changes the different values of changes, but uh, in such a case, the answer will be uh, zero. Zero changes we will find after. Okay. So, uh, the outline of this talk will be first to come back to very basic things about long memory processes, after to consider a stationary long memory process and some uh, procedure for estimation of the parameter and at the end only we will go back to the, 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 the problem of change detection. Okay, some very basic things about long memory processes. So, uh, first, uh, I consider a uh, uh, second order stationary <coughs> processes process and the first definition of long memory is uh, when the sun of the autocorrelation or autocovariance of, of the process is infinite. So this is a more basic definition. But uh, here a very, uh, a very uh, 
simple uh, example could be to consider a sequence xk where all the different xk are equal to x0. So, an x0 is a random variable. In such a case, you have a long memory process. And you are stationary also. Okay, but uh, such a case is not really interesting. And this definition of log memory is not really satisfying because it is not a quantitative definition. And uh, you, you would like to, to model the memory. And so, another uh, definition of long memory uh, that appeared, I think, 50 years ago, uh, with uh, Mandelbrot and uh, Earth first and Mandelbrot and uh, Taku and others, is when the, the covariance, the autocovariance of the process decreases as the power law. And here you have a power law uh, with a parameter d between 0 and 1, and uh, also a uh, uh, slowly varying function at the infinity that is L here and typically L is uh, a function going to a limit or a logarithm or something like this. Okay, in such a case the first very basic uh, example I gave you previously could not satisfy such, such a definition. Okay, because uh, you have uh, all the covariants are equal here, and so it's not a power law. Okay, this is a temporal definition, and you could go to the sp a spectral definition. In such a case, uh, you consider a spectral density of the process. So the spectral when it exists, you consider the spectral density of the process, and uh, it, the, the process will be called as a long memory process if the spectral density are pole at zero. That is, uh, close to zero, uh, the spectral density uh, uh, follow also a power law, uh, lambda for d minus one, and uh, with d between zero and one, and m now is also a slowly, slowly value function in infinity. Uh, there is uh, a way from going to the first definition here with covariance and to the other definition with spectral density. Uh, the first definition implies always the second definition, this is an Abelian program, but here you have just to, to add an assumption of decreasing of R of R to, to go from this one to the other. Okay, so now two very famous examples of long memory processes. Um, first, uh, I'm going to speak about fractional Gaussian nodes, but the, the, typically we, we prefer to define first a fractional Bolland motion, which is a Gaussian process with stationary increments and with uh, covariance, uh, uh, with covariance, which is also power low in T. Okay, so this is a natural extension of the Brownian or Weiner uh, motion. Um, okay, so it is central. Now, so now uh, we have two properties of such a process. First, this is the only Gaussian uh, self-similar uh, stationary increment process and also another property if you consider the increment of such, uh, of such process uh, you obtain fractional Gaussian nodes and it's not really difficult to prove that in such a case the autocovariance uh, behaves as also a power law where the power is 2h minus 2, that is, when you consider h between 1 over 2 and 1, it is, this power is between uh, 0 and minus 1, as we said previously. 
So this is a longer process in such a case. Second famous uh, example, this is an extension of ARMA processes, which, call, which are called uh, FARMA or AFIMA process. And the F is for fractional and the I is for integrated. So, uh, you have a definition which is given from a white nose, epsilon here, and so first you have uh, an equation using uh, the shift, uh, the shift uh, operator B, the, the backward operator. This is a usual uh, definition. And, uh, but perhaps for those who, who never seen something like this, uh, I've given here a, a, a definition here using uh, gamma functions, and so xk, the process we consider, which is a long memory process, is defined as a linear process of eta, and eta follows such equation here. And so, for instance, if you consider that uh, p and q are equal to zero, you could replace eta by eta, and you, will, you obtain the, 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 the most simple Farmer process, which is a Farmer zero d zero, and you have uh, the equation here. So, in such a case, uh, it is not very difficult to obtain the spectral entity. For, for ARMA or for FARMA, it is better to, to, to work with spectral densities than with uh, autocovalence because uh, covalence are not really easy to be obtained. But here, for spectral density, you have directly uh, the, 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 an expression of the spectral density, and so if the parameter D here uh, is between 0 and 1 over 2, you obtain such uh, behavior, which is also a, a power law behavior, and uh, this is exactly what, what is required to obtain a long memory process. Okay? So, two examples. And uh, now we can extend such example because. Uh, fractional Gaussian nose is also a linear process using this definition. That is, uh, a linear process is a one sided linear process, is a sum of an, uh, an infinite sum of uh, white nose epsilon defined like this. And if now we consider that uh, the coefficient ag uh, decrease as power law again on the slowly uh, varying function, we obtain low memory process. Okay? So, this is what I first want to say about long memory process. Now, we will, we will have, uh, go to, to a statistical framework, which is to estimate the parameter of a long memory process. So, first, we have a long memory process with a parameter D, um, capital D, between 0 and 1, and x1 to xn is an observed trajectory of x. So, we would like to propose a consistent estimator of D and to study the asymptotic behavior of it. So, a natural uh, way for doing it when typically you have a Gaussian uh, process, is to use the likelihood. So, I do not want to spend a lot of time, so you, you, you could explain, you could uh, uh, obtain an explicit uh, likelihood when you use sigma. Sigma is, uh, is uh, the covariance matrix. You could see here because uh, we, we deal with uh, a stationary process. You <laughs> can see that sigma is a topic matrix. Uh, that is, it's only defined between uh, the difference between uh, uh, the uh, index. 
And so, you obtain a way for estimating the parameter of uh, the process if we consider that theta is the parameter of the process. Okay, so, this is theoretically, 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 sorry, uh, a way for estimating, but there are numerous drawbacks of such procedure. First, it requires the knowledge of the exact distribution of the, of the process. Even in the Gaussian case, the pseudo of uh, the asymptotic behavior is not really uh, easy because you know, you, you see here we, we use the inverse matrix of uh, the covariance and so on. And numerically, except in certain, case, certain, certain cases, it's really difficult to obtain uh, an estimation because you have to uh, inverse such matrix. And so, uh, typically for n greater than 10,000, it, it becomes really, it becomes to be very, uh, very difficult. So, a way for uh, improving such estimation procedure is to use uh, a little approximation. That is, basically it is a sub uh, theorem uh, that is now, uh, if you consider a Gaussian central expansionary process, you could approximate when n going to infinity uh, uh, the renormalized log likelihood uh, by a contrast, uh, I call it uh, at un, which is defined by this way, using, uh, using this integral and using also the spectral density and uh, not exactly a, an estimation of the spectral density, but close to be the periodogram, which is defined here and which is a quadratic form of the process and uh, which appears in, in this integral. Okay, so uh, in case of low memory process, Dallarus proved that uh, this uh, theorem is uh, still valid. And now this contrast will be called the Winter contrast. And uh, we could define an estimator as the minimum of this contrast. Okay, so we numerous uh, um, uh, research uh, we, uh, has been done on such contrast and for instance function Taku and Dallas obtain uh, uh, asymptotic normality of this estimator in the case of stationary Gaussian low memory process defined here and uh, you could see that the, uh, the covariance covariant rate is uh, square root of n. This is a usual uh, convergence rate here. So it could be applied for uh, fractional Gaussian nodes or for uh, Gaussian Fermi. And there are some extensions uh, by Dallas. First, Dallas, using Winter contrast, obtained some result about. Uh, the likelihood uh, estimator and Giratis and Sugeris obtained some uh, extension for uh, non Gaussian but for linear process here, sorry, for linear process uh, with uh, second, uh, fourth order uh, condition. Okay, so this is uh, what I proposed here is in a parametric uh, framework. That is, we know everything about the process. But we prefer, generally, to use a semi-parametric framework. That is, we do not know exactly uh, what is the spectral density or the autocovalence, but here we will <laughs> deal with uh, spectral density. We will would like to know only what is the asymptotic behavior of the spectral density close to zero. And so for now on, we will use such, uh, such uh, uh, expansion of the spectral density around zero. And so now using this a 
assumption, we would like to estimate the parameter t. So now, only the behavior around the rule of spectral density is now. And d is unknown. And so, the Wittel estimator, which is defined here, could not be used because f is unknown. So, we, would, we have to, uh, we could use such contrast, but we have to restrict uh, the uh, integration domain and to be close to zero. And this is the idea uh, that has been developed by Robinson in uh, 95, which defines the local metal, metal contrast. That is, to use not the integral between minus P and P, but some, uh, uh, some uh, bones of the integral going to zero. And by this way, we could replace the spectral density by its asymptotic behavior around zero. And so, we obtain, by this way, such uh, estimator where there is a new parameter uh, n here which go to infinity but slower than uh, n which is the number of uh, the number of uh, 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 the size of the, the, the length of the trajectory and so we could define an, a new estimator of uh, the long memory process, uh, the long memory parameter, which minimize this new uh, contrast, which is a local middle contrast. Okay, so Robinson obtained some result uh, of, and obtained asymptotic normality of such estimator, and uh, where M is now the parameter which gives the, the convergence rate. And uh, this uh, asymptotic normality has been, has been improved by uh, Dalla, Duraitis, and Hidalgo. And uh, if we choose M uh, with respect to uh, beta, uh, I'm going back, but beta is the second order uh, expansion of the spectral density. So typically it is unknown. But if we, we choose beta, with respect, uh, M with respect to beta, we could obtain an optimal convergence rate which is close uh, to this convergence rate. And this is exactly what uh, Geraitis, Robinson, and Samarov obtain uh, rate optimal in the minimax sense of the estimate. But beta is unknown, and so could we obtain a, an adaptive estimator of the, the, the contrast here? In case where uh, beta is unknown, uh, this is an open question. They are not really satisfying uh, with answer to, to, to this question. But beta is equal to 2, for instance, for fractional Gaussian nodes or for Farmer processes. So we could use this estimate but by fixing beta equal to 2, for instance. So, uh, see that? Three minutes? Three minutes. Right. So, the framework of uh, uh, detection, uh, change detection, will be this one. Uh, we have some, uh, a number k star of changes, which is unknown, and uh, uh, we have, uh, in each stage, we have a linear process, which is a long memory stationary process, um, with a parameter d k star which is unknown. Okay, so uh, perhaps uh, this is a, a, a trajectory here. Here you have d1, d2, and d3, and here a linear process with such uh, parameter here also, and so on. Okay, so there exists some. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, previously uh, some article about, about such problem. For instance, Beran, Lavier, and Lidena, perhaps the so closest to what I've done, uh, rough with uh, tests and one also. So, what we could do? 
I still have two minutes, so I, I have to go very fast. Uh, we could consider on a stage a local Witten contrast. And from now on, if I fix T1, T2, Tk, I consider a sum of this local contrast. Okay? A, a, a weighted sum of this local contrast. This will be the way for estimating the different uh, change dates. And, okay, so we could obtain some asymptotic result. That is, under not uh, really, uh, not say everything, but uh, with, uh, if uh, parameter m is uh, negligible with respect with m, and if the different change are uh, proportional to the number of, uh, to the length of the trajectory, we obtain uh, this asymptotic result. And we could obtain also the convergence rate of such, uh, of such uh, estimator. <laughs> okay, so here I'm going to refer. Okay, so it, it, what is proved here is that it, it converges. Okay, so. <laughs> no, so, one minute for the last question, which is how could we find a way for estimating k? Because here I do not say that here k is still known, but if k is a known. So, uh, a typical way for doing this is to use a penalized contrast. That is, we, we use the previous contrast, which is a, a, a sum of, so a weighted sum of local local contrast, and we have, we have a term which depends on the number of stage of k. And uh, times beta n, beta n which is a second going to zero. And by this way, we could obtain some result, and to finish with, uh, we, we use uh, the slope heuristic procedure for selecting beta uh, using that. So perhaps it's too fast for you, but we, we could use such a way for, for this, and by this way we could prove the, all those results uh, of convergence, and finally we could find the number of, of uh, in different case find the number of, uh, of, of changes not too bad, not too bad, kh for the slope heuristic uh, estimate. So, so it I, uh, I was too slow at the beginning. So. Thank you very much. Approximation because it's going fast to, to, to stop. 
discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Valentin and Sunny and uh, the others for uh, organizing this fantastic workshop. It's, it's really great to be here. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking about another change point problem to do with uh, estimating a high dimensional change in mean. Uh, this is something that I've, uh, I worked on a few years ago with my colleague Ten Yao Wong, who's now at uh, LSE. Uh, but this is taking things a little bit further and dealing, trying to deal with missingness in change point problems, which actually I think is one of the most important uh, areas for, uh, to kind of push the, the, the change point methodology. So uh, originally we had the INSPECT methodology for estimating a high dimensional change in mean, it's short for informative sparse projection for estimating change points, uh, and, and now we have MISINSPECT. So uh, the collaborators for the project, or MISINSPECT herself, is Bertil Fallin. So Bertil was uh, a master's student at École Politique Nique when she uh, first got in touch with me, she wanted to do an internship with me. Uh, then she came to part three in, in Cambridge and is now just finishing her first year of her PhD with um, uh, Francis Bach at Henry. So Teng Yao was my PhD student and my postdoc. Uh, in, uh, in now, let's see. Uh, uh, it's really handsome. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, he, he was my PhD student and postdoc, uh, moved to UCL and is now at Percy. Okay, so uh, we've already had a great introduction uh, about the importance of change points from Valentin's boss. Uh, so I don't need to say too, too much uh, about the, the fact that we collect uh, huge amounts of time-ordered data uh, these days, and, and change points are, are uh, a very important feature of much of this data. Uh, about a year ago, I blacked out in the swimming pool, which was not a great um, thing to happen, but uh, I now have a, a defibrillator fitted. Uh, and believe me, change points in, in defibrillator processes are of interest to me. So, uh, the other feature uh, of, of... Oh, I can't do this. <laughs> I abandoned the screen and work, work from here. Uh, so, the, the other feature that we often have to deal with now is, is monitoring many uh, data streams simultaneously. Okay, so uh, as well as uh, the change point problem, I think missingness is, is really a crucial feature to be able to handle for a, a lot of um, modern statistical methodology. You, you might think it in the era of big data, why do I need to care about missingness? I've just got so much data. Uh, but I want to try to convince you with a very simple example that actually is even more important now than it ever was. So, um, Imagine a very toy example of, of, of doing a, a, a complete case analysis on a data matrix as an n by d data matrix where every entry is missing with 1% probability independent. So a complete case analysis just means I'm going to ignore any individual, any row, where I have any missingness. Well, if I've only got five columns to my design matrix, it's sort of 20th century uh, problem, then I don't lose too much when I do that because I get to keep about 95% of, of my observations. But even by the time I get up to 300 uh, columns, which is by no means large by today's standards, then the situation is a disaster that I only get to keep about 5% of my data. Right? So I really have to decide what I'm going to do uh, with, with uh, the, the, the missings. Okay, and there's a particular reason for, for caring about it in... in uh, in problems, in change point problems or, or problems where the processes are evolve simultaneously over time, and that is that you may not um, ob observe observation synchronously. So if you're uh, looking at many stock prices, for example, then these are not traded at exactly the same time, and so you can think of uh, all the missing, all, all the other times as just missing uh, data observation. So you're not seeing your data on, on a grid of time points necessarily, that, that amounts to having, having missing. <coughs> Okay, so what we're going to try and do is to estimate a high dimensional sparse change in mean where our data are corrupted in missingness. And, and just a couple of motivating examples. Uh, one is a, a, a French river temperature data set from 2018 where uh, the white here is indicating missingness 
And another that I'll mention more about uh, towards the end of the talk is an oceanographic data set. Uh, it, these are different cores that are being drilled into the ocean floor, and as you can see, you really need to take a kind of estimates in that problem. So we're going to try to develop a, a robust methodology, but also from a theoretical point of view to quantify the interplay between the signal strength and, and the missingness in the determining the difficulty of the problem. Okay, so here's our problem set up. Uh, our observed data are in the form of a Hanuman product of my data X and, and a revelation matrix omega as well as omega. So uh, the reason for including omega here is just so I don't need to worry about having NAs for, for missing this. So it means that if I see a zero because I'm, I'm taking a Hanuman product with this omega matrix and it's missing, I know it's missing because I see omega as well. It's not just a, an observed zero. So uh, X would here would be my full data matrix, it's going to be a P by N uh, data matrix. So of course we're used to having N by P design matrices in statistics. This is P by N because we've got P coordinates and we're thinking of time as evolving from left to right. Um, and our revelation matrix is, is, is an, again a, it's a binary matrix, a P by N matrix, uh, whose J teeth entry is 1 if I observe that entry of X and, and 0 other. Okay, so, um, well, it, it, it's going to be convenient to think about my data as coming from uh, a Gaussian distribution independently over, over time with a piecewise constant mean and just a single uh, change point, so a very simple uh, uh, data generating mechanism here. p variant Gaussian with, with uh, um, uh, a diagonal um, or scalable to the identity matrix or its covariance matrix. And we're going to think of the, the, the change in mean as being sparse. So most of the coordinates are not going to undergo a change. It's only going to be a small proportion that do. And then I need to talk about the, the missingness mechanism. And again, that's going to be uh, very simple. Uh, we've just got our, our revelation matrix entries being uh, Bernoulli random variables. But the, the, uh, the heterogeneity in the missingness that comes in the title is from the fact that the, the missingness probability is allowed to depend on, on the, uh, the row that you're in. Okay. So you might ask, well, how do you know if, if your data are going to be independent, of, of the missingness is independent of your data? That's a, a very crucial assumption. And then I'm going to have to refer you to Tom Barrett's talk this, this afternoon. So it's a lot about that. Okay, so our goal here is to estimate the change point location Z. So Z, Z is the last time that, that we observed the, the first mean. Okay, so in order to introduce the, the misinspect methodology, I need to go back a stage and just remind people, for those, or, or inform people who are not so familiar with the original inspect methodology. So uh, the inspect uh, algorithm was designed for the fully observed case, and the, the aim is to try to aggregate component series by finding a good projection direction. So we've got this multivariate time series, and we're going to try and project it into one dimension in a good way. Um, and once we've done that, we can just estimate the change point location by the uh, location of the maximum of the Q-sum transformation of the transform series. Okay, so here's a cartoon of, of what we're doing here. We've got a, uh, our signal here, so we're, we're, we're uh, piecewise constant in all the coordinates. Many of them are not changing at all, but a small number of them are changing and simultaneously in time. Okay? This is corrupted by noise, so what we get to see is, is, is this X matrix here. So I want to find a good projection direction. Well, let's take, think about an arbitrary projection direction A. What happens to my data vectors? Well, we know what happens with linear transformation of Gaussian variables. We, we get univariate Gaussian observations. And so the, the mean on the left half of the data is A transpose mu1. The mean on the right half of the data is uh, A transpose mu2. And I want to try to make that difference in mean as big as possible to, to maximize the signal to noise ratio. So I want to try to maximize A transpose times mu1 minus mu2. And so the way to do that is to choose the projection direction proportional to this difference in mean. Okay. So that's what we call the theta vector. Of course, we don't know the theta vector. That's a population quantity. So we're going to try and estimate it. And how we do that, we, we compute the Q sum transformation of the data. So this is this takes my P by N matrix and it returns a matrix with one less column, uh, N minus one columns, and it acts row by row. So in order to, to work out the, the Jth uh, row of the Q-sum transformation, I only need to look at the Jth uh, coordinate of the data. 
It's very easy. What we do, we just look at the computed at time t, we look at the, the mean of the data to the right of t and subtract the mean of the data to the left of t. And okay, then we rescale it. The rescaling is done so that if there's no change in mean, then this is going to be like a Brownian group. <laughs> Discrete observation of Brownian group. So we had this, this uh, signal plus noise equals the data we have. This Q sum transformation is a linear transformation. So uh, I can apply it, I get the Q sum transformation of the, the signal plus the Q sum transformation of the noise gives me what I observe, the Q sum transformation of the data. And, and, and this is what we're looking at in, in, in the signal coordinates. You've got these peaks uh, in, in the signal coordinates around the change point. So that's what's going to help us try to identify where the change point location is. Uh, so, just some notation, I'll write A for the Q-sum transformation of the, the mean matrix, E for the Q-sum transformation of the noise matrix, and T for the Q-sum transformation of my data. So, in this signal, single change point situation, it turns out that the Q-sum transformation of the mean matrix is a rank 1 matrix, uh, with a leading left singular vector theta, that's the thing I care about, and the right singular vector is a gamma transpose, so that's that's a uh, vector that I know up to the location of the change point. So it's a known function of the change point location. So the, the idea is that, that since this is the leading left singular vector of, the, uh, of this matrix A, the idea is going to be to compute a, a leading k-sparse leading uh, left singular vector of the Q-sum transformation by data matrix. And I can define this like this. So this is a k-sparse unit ball in p dimensions, unit, unit sphere in p dimensions. So um, that's a very natural strategy. The trouble is that this is an NP hard problem because I've got to search through all the P choose K possible subsets, uh, sparse subsets. So we're going to look at a convex relaxation, uh, and the way we do this is to, to rewrite the objective function in this way. We can use the Cauchy Schwarz inequality to write this uh, as a maximum over two different variables, a U and a W, and then uh, realize that the, the Write the real number as its trace, and then uh, use the cyclic permutation property of the trace to rewrite this in, in this way. And so we end up with an optimization problem, an objective function that's linear in, in this matrix M, where M belongs to this, this uh, set of matrices here that have nuclear norm 1, rank norm 1, rank 1, and the number of non zero rows less than or equal to K. Okay. Well, the, the, these orange constraints here are non convex. So the idea is just to, to form a convex relaxation by putting an L, L1 entry-wise penalty uh, on this matrix M. Uh, and then we try to optimize this over this ball in the, in the unit ball in, in the nuclear norm. So uh, that's a kind of very quick recap of how the original inspect uh, algorithm works, uh, how we compute the projection direction, and then once we've done that, we project the data along this direction and form a univariate series, and then uh, we can estimate the change point location by the, the maximum, the absolute value of this Q sum transformation. Okay, well here's the trouble. When you've got missingness, you can't think about projecting the data, because that doesn't make sense when you've got missingness, right? Um, but the key idea is that you can still think about projecting the Q sum transformation. And you can extend the, the idea of the Q-sum transformation that's missing data set. So we're going to try and project the, the, the Q-sum transformation instead. So here is the, the analogue of the Q-sum transformation for the missing data setting, called the missed Q-sum transformation. So this is the number of observations that we have to the left of T within the data coordinate. This is the number of observations we have to the right. So Nj is the total number that we see in, in the J coordinate. That's a random number but it, we, we know a lot about its concentration properties. Um, and then, this is the Q sum transformation, the missed Q sum transformation, it looks somewhat similar, uh, but now we're rescaling things by just the number of observations that we see on, on either side. Okay. Um, in particular, if we did happen to observe all the data on a single coordinate, then this would amount to, uh, the, this would reduce to the original some transformation of the data. Okay, so um, we, we, we want to try to find a good projection direction from this. So the thinking is that we can think of this missed Q sum transformation as a perturbation of, of this sort of 
partial um, mean matrix, the A omega, where we take the expectation of my data matrix X, but I've still got the randomness from, from the omega. Uh, that in turn is not low rank in its own right, but it can be regarded as a perturbation of a rank one matrix. Uh, and this rank one matrix, the leading less singular vector, is theta Hadamard product with the square root of Q. So this, this Q is, is the vector of uh, observation probability. And we've got the same vector gamma on the right hand side. So instead of having an oracle projection directed proportional to theta now, it's proportional to theta Hadamard product with the, the square root of q. Okay, so somewhat similarly, but a little bit differently uh, from, from what we had in the no missing this case, we're going to think again about uh, sparse leading less singular vectors, but actually. It's in that slightly uh, transformed form that we want to think about it, where we've now got our two variables again, a V and a W. We're thinking about this sort of mixed quadratic form, um, and we've got the, the, the sparse constraint, which again uh, is a non-convex constraint. Um, that would, as well as being a non-convex optimization problem, require the knowledge of K. Um, and it turns out, this was something we observed empirically, that, that uh, it's just too coarse if you just try to do a similar sort of semi-definite relaxation to what we did last time. And so we come up, came up with a different strategy, which is to think about relaxing this problem into a biconcave optimization problem. So we're going to try to maximize simultaneously over the V and the W in these unit balls. And now with an, uh, an entry-wise penalty only on the, on the V vector here. So one of the nice things about this is this is directly exploiting the row sparsity uh, structure of the problem, whereas previously we had an L1 uh, entry-wise penalty on, on this matrix M that was only kind of penalizing entry by entry, not, not, not taking into account the uh, row sparsity structure. Okay, so here is the uh, pseudocode for the misinspect algorithm. Um, so we compute the uh, the Q sum transformation, the mis Q sum transformation of my observed data matrix, and then I'm going to try to uh, optimize this, this biconcave optimization problem. So I need to say a little bit more about how I'm going to do that, but then finally I'm going to maximize the absolute value of the projected uh, data series, the projected mis Q sum transformed data series. If I've got many maximizers, I'll take the median. So in order to compute them, this, this maximizer, the, the natural approach to solving biconcave optimization problems is to alternate between updating uh, the V and updating the W. And it turns out that you've got closed form updates in, in both cases here, which is very convenient. And you just need to normalize, renormalize re uh, this sort of uh, trans linear transformation here and then this soft thresholding operation. And I say until convergence, well, we don't have a proof that this, this uh, converges to the global optimum always, but uh, we didn't observe any problems with, uh, with, with convergence. You can have multiple restarts and you end up with the same thing. Good. So um, here's an illustration of the, the algorithm in action. This is the sort of data you, you, you see. It, it looks a mess. There's a lot of missingness uh, and it's hard to, to see the structure. Uh, if you compute the MISQ sum transformation of the data, you can see that there's probably something going on in, in the first few rows, and actually that is the case. There are 100 uh, rows in this problem, and, and the sparsity level is 10, and, and, and the, it's the first 10 rows that are undergoing changes here. The change point, the true change point is at time 100, it's a, in a series of 250, so it's sort of 40% uh, of the way along is where the true change point is. So, uh, if I plot the individual series, the, the individual Q-sum series here, you'll notice that they're piecewise constant. So if I don't see any observations uh, in this, in, uh, between two time points in this mis q uh transformation, then, then I stay constant. And moreover, uh, some of them are quite good estimates, like the green one would be a good estimate of the true change point location, but the purple one, which is another signal coordinate, so I've just plotted the first five coordinates here, the purple one would definitely be a very, very bad estimate of the true uh, change point location. So I've got to do some clever aggregation uh, to, uh, to try to find a good estimate of the change point location. 
And, and the, the aggregated series is, is this black trace that, that I get here, and I estimate it by, by its maximum, which is not too bad an estimate of the true change point location. So then what we did was we repeated this exercise a thousand times, and this is the, the histogram of the estimated change point locations that we get, as well as a very good density estimate uh, called the log concave maximum likelihood estimator uh, here, which is very convenient for uh, when you want to do simulations about change points in univariate uh, cases, because you expect things to be unimodal and to have reasonably light tails here. And so instead of having a situation where, where you, when you want to compare methods, you have to choose bandwidths, and it's a, you worry about whether your, your bandwidth choice is, is really uh, determining how good the, the density estimates are looking. Here, this is a fully automatic, non-parametric density estimator. You've got no, no bandwidths to choose. Uh, and, and it's pretty, pretty well concentrated, actually, exactly around the true change point location of 100, but that's, that's a little bit of chance there. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about theory now. Um, I'm going to let Tor be, be this sort of um, uh, the proportion of, of, of the series into which the, the change point occurs. And then a, a key quantity for us is going to be this 2q norm of, of my, uh, my signal vector theta. So th this is weighting the, the L2 norm by the uh, number of the, the, the proportion of, of observations that I see on average in, in that coordinate. Um, so the first thing I want to try to understand is how well am I doing in estimating uh, the angle between the, uh, the, the by getting out from my uh, missing spec algorithm and the oracle uh, projection direction, this theta had on our product with the square root of q. And so with high probability, uh, the sign of the angle is bounded above by the sum of two terms. And what's nice is that these two terms both have very clear interpretations. The first one of these is representing the estimation error caused by the noise in the data. You can think of this uh, 2q norm of theta divided by sigma as like a signal to noise ratio. Um, and then the second term is really talking about the, the, the missingness. So this, this, this ratio of the 2q norm uh, to the original 2 norm can be regarded as a sort of signal weighted observation probability. Uh, so two, two, uh, both the noise in, in the problem and the uh, the, the missingness of effect how well you can uh, estimate this angle. Um, so the, the main messages from uh, the, this, our theory is, is we're, we're going to try to aim to show that we do indeed get a good change point uh, location estimator. In order to do that, there's one little trick that we need. The trouble is that when, if you, when you use your data to be the projection direction, and then you project the original data series into one dimension, then you've got dependence across time. Uh, and so the way we get around that is to think about a sample splitting procedure where we use the odd number of time points to, to get the projection direction and then we project, uh, having completed that, we project the even number of time points to get our univariate series. So if we're only caring about rates, we don't lose too much. This is not actually what we necessarily recommend to use in practice, but for proving theory it's very convenient. Uh, and it turns out that we get two different rates, a slow rate and a fast rate, uh, according to whether we make an additional assumption on the, uh, on the number of observations that we see in each coordinate. Um, so this is a more precise form of uh, the, the final bounds that we get. So we, we ask for uh, a sufficiently strong signal and observation proportion to guarantee that I can get a non-trivial angle with the, uh, with, with the oracle projection direction. And then th this is the slow rate here. Um, and if I have at least this, this number uh, of, of observations in each coordinate on average, then we get a faster rate, which is essentially the square of, of, of the slow rate. So this is the one I, I kind of want to focus on. What's this asking for? So n times tor times uh, the minimum of the qj's would be the, the, the um, smallest average number of, of observations you observe on, on either side of the change point. Uh, so we ask for that to sort of be growing in this uh, uh, way that, that is at least a sparsity level times a logarithmic factor. Um, and, and then we get this, this, again, this sum of two terms in, in uh, the high probability bound on, on the uh, estimation error. So again, they have the interpretation of, of an estimation error term and, and a, a missingness. 
And then this is complemented by a corresponding minimax lower bound, uh, which is of the same form. It has an additional restriction. This restriction with the M here is sort of saying that we're, we're asking for each of the signals coordinates to have sort of comparable magnitude. Uh, so not wildly different um, signal strengths in different coordinates. Uh, and then the, the, we're getting exactly the same terms uh, cropping up here. Okay, so that's theory. Um, what about numerical studies? Uh, so the first thing is, well, there, there was a tuning parameter in, in, our, in our theory. And our theory told us that we should choose it to be 2 times sigma times the square root factor. What we observed is that that's a little bit conservative. And so we, we, we thought about uh, what happens if we, we allow a general A instead of a 2 here. Uh, and this, this is sort of showing plots about um, how well we perform in terms of the angle, estimating the angle between the, the uh, estimated projection direction and the true projection direction or the oracle projection direction. And what you'll see is that typically we, the sort of best uh, choice of A is, is around about a half. So that's what we're going to use in our simulation. So this is for different signal strengths in the solid lines, different sparsity levels in the, uh, in the, the different uh, dashed lines. Um, and then uh, over here, this is for different um, observation probabilities and signal coordinates and the noise coordinates. And what you'll see is that the noise coordinate uh, observation probability makes very little difference to, to the shape of the curve and the signal coordinate affects the, the overall curve, but not so much its, its, uh, its minimum location, which is kind of interesting. So we found that this choice of A equals a half is, is a quite a reliable one in practice. So here's quite an interesting plot, I, I think, about uh, estimating, again, the, the, uh, the sign of the angle or its logarithm uh, for different uh, signal-to-noise ratios and missing this probability, as well as the change point location. So this is a little bit cleaner as a plot, so let's think about this. So we've got, we've got sort of uh, fragments of, of length 4 here, and, and what's going on is, is you go from circle to triangle to square to diamond, is that we're doubling the observation probability. Uh, and unsurprisingly, we're, we're getting an improved uh, angle between the estimated projection direction and the oracle projection direction when we do that. And then, uh, when we go from the blue to the orange, we're doubling the, the, the signal strength. Okay? And then, uh, on, on, as we go vertically, uh, we've got this sort of roughly constant separation, and that's changing the noise level. So, what you can see is that um, doubling the, the observation probability is, is pretty much the same as, as halving the, um, uh, the signal strength, and that's in accordance with our theory. And again, you've got these, these, uh, if you look at the gradients of the lines and the, their separation, that again agrees with the theory. This is mainly driven by the first term in those bounds, but then what you'll see when you get to high signal to noise ratio settings, you get this deviation from, from the, 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 the straight lines, and that's the second term, the, the missingness, uh, and playing, playing a more significant role uh, in, in the bounds at this point. So this, this is very much in, in line with, with, our, uh, with our theoretical results. Um, okay, so... Uh, let's compare with uh, an alternative. This is the Im impute inspect uh, algorithm that so we, we came up with as an alternative. A natural way to try to solve this problem is to first try to impute the missing data and then just run the original inspect algorithm. So how can we impute? Impute you, you can uh, use a, a soft impute algorithm. It's a very popular matrix completion algorithm for uh, imputing low rank uh, data in, in low rank matrices. Um, and then we're going to project, compare both the angle between the, uh, the uh, uh, estimated projection direction of the truth and its change, the change point location. So MI is short for the misinspect and II is impute inspect. Mm -hmm. And if we focus, for instance, on the change, estimated change point location, we're always doing better than this impute in, in, inspect algorithm in all sorts of different uh, sparsity levels and, and signal strengths. Uh, and, and this new parameter, which is telling me how many, uh, about force and missing this, and really often we're doing vastly better than this in computer spec algorithm, which is, is kind of interesting. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up rather quickly, uh, I wanted to come back to this um, uh, oceanographic data set from the, uh, the Neogene period, which goes back to the last, in the last 23 million years. Um, so what oceanographers do, they, they 
go out and in different oceans and they drill cores into the ocean floor. So they extract sediment from those cores and then they slice those at different depths where the depth is used as a proxy for age into the past. They look at the foraminifera uh, within these things, these are microfossils, and look at carbon isotope ratios. They use this to try to understand past, past ocean current floods. So this was an original data set and when we ran our mis inspect algorithm, the most prominent change point was at this time 6.13 million years ago, and that's actually previously identified as a, a, a time of rapid change in oceanographic current flow, which I found quite interesting. Um, okay, so just to wrap up, then this what we've done is try to propose a new algorithm for uh, estimating change points in, in high-dimensional change in mean problems where we have missing. Uh, so we introduce a MISQ sum transformation to, to, uh, in order to be able to project this MISQ sum transformation uh, into one dimension uh, and then uh, use a fairly standard algorithm. Uh, and, and the theory in reveals a sort of interesting interplay between the uh, signal strength and the missing uh, probabilities. So if you're interested, you can try this out. Uh, it's available in the inspect changepoint R package and the paper is available. Uh, it's going to appear in JRS as well. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Richard. Are there questions? Yes? So, essentially, it was assumed that there is at least one change point in the data there. Mm -hmm. So, the question is what will happen to the algorithm if there is no change in the data there? Uh, that's a good question. Um, um, I think, um, I mean, I don't think it's going to concentrate around any, around any value at that point. So my concern is, so if you, okay, it's essentially you have the standard condition D times 4 minus yeah. So in this case, okay, if there is no change, this can be as big as the square root of log log and this is n times d. But then you have, okay, at the upper bound, the square root of log, then of course, okay, the sooner later, the log log will be below that. Yeah? So, so in this case, I think the algorithm, okay, sooner or later, we will say change, even if there is not in it. And this is the problem with the square root of log n then. So, in the classical case, when you are using this weight function as a good one, essentially it puts the change, the probability one, before or after the end of the data there. Yeah, it will be concentrated, as you said. Yeah? So, when there is no change in the data there, okay, and you are estimating the time of change, yeah? Mm -hmm. When you are using this weight square root of 3 times 1 minus 3, then in this case, the change point which is detected is the first observation or the last one, it's probably one half. Yeah? No, so I, don't, I don't think it's wrong. I, I'm sure that it's correct. Yeah? So, roughly so, 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 the data for change, essentially, is trying to put the change point outside of the data set. Yeah? Okay, so, uh, so th this is not so much what, what we studied in the missingness problem, but with the, with the non missingness problem, uh, we, we have. A, a clear threshold that you would need the the, uh, the maximum of the uh, key sum transformation to exceed yeah. in, in order to be confident that there is a change point there. Um, what we said in the missing in this missingness problem is, is a situation where uh, you know you have a change point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Other questions? I think a lot, I think, lunch is waiting.